Now get your Bibles. Psalms 15. You'll have to look at it uh, because this lesson is, is designed to help every one of us answer, a- answer some questions. You look, you look at Psalms 15. Look at slide number three that says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? That's the beginning of it. And the end of it, look down at the bottom of the screen. The bottom of the screen says, He who does these things shall never be moved. Is that what you want? Now, you put that in a Jewish setting. You put that in a biblical setting. And, and, and here is David. And, 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 and there he is thinking about Mount Zion. And sitting right up there on Mount Zion is that tabernacle. It's before the temple was actually built, it's that tent that was there. And inside, inside that tabernacle is the holy place and the most holy place on earth. Now I want you to imagine of the visible manifestation of God that was there whenever that tabernacle was first erected. Then when Solomon was later to to build the the temple, there was a manifestation of God's presence in a cloud that came down from heaven and covered up that place. You could see God in that place. And David, with the eye of faith, could stand and look at that holy mountain there, Mount Zion, and sitting right on top of Mount Zion is the tabernacle. And he says, oh, how I wish how I wish I could be there forever and ever in the very presence of God. Now, is that what your heart wants? Isn't, doesn't that just really sum it up? Don't you want forever and ever and ever to be in the very presence of God? And so David says, Lord, Who is this individual? Who is this individual that is going to be able to abide there? There's Mount Zion. There's the holy place. There's the most holy place. And I wish I could just be there forever. Isn't that what Peter said at the Mount of Transfiguration? When he saw Jesus transfigured before them and Moses and Elijah was there. You know what Peter says? this is the greatest place on earth. Let's build three tents. We want to stay here in this place. And so the lesson today is to look at Psalms 15. Now, I understand, and I know you understand also, that there are doctrinal things, and I even hate to use that word, because even the, the, even the matter of daily living is called doctrine in Titus, the second chapter. Speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. And then he just begins to talk about, about home life and, and about the way we ought to live every day of our life. So that is doctrinal. But I use that in an accommodative way to say, David understood that there were the animal sacrifices that were a part of this. David understood that there were the feast days. He understood that there was the Sabbath day. He understood all of the, all of the, uh, the manifestations and, uh, in a visible way of, of serving God. Just like you and I understand it. You and I have an appreciation of, of this table, do we not? You and I have an appreciation of baptism and you and I have an appreciation of all of the, all of the visible manifestations of, of, of what, I, what it means to be a Christian. That's not what David is asking here. David is not talking about Sunday worship when he asks this question. He's not talking about the Sabbath rituals that they might have had. He's talking about daily living and, and, of, and of getting and of getting this thing that's here in our our hearts and in our lives while we're in this place and and, and getting it it to the the schoolhouse. Getting it to the workplace. Getting it out there in the, not not just the hours we spend here, but getting it 24-7 in your life. And so David picks out four things, four attributes of those who can live on the mountaintop with God. It may be, in fact, it is reality 
that there's really more than four. But here's the man who was a man after God's own heart and he was looking at Israel and at the needs of Israel and he says, these things are of capital importance. And if they're important to the man that is a man after God's own heart, they ought to be important to us. The morality of the Old Testament is the morality of the New Testament because both of them are based on God. Those visible manifestations of, of the sacrifices and the holy days and, 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 and some of the rituals of Judaism, they change from time to time, from, one, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But the morality of God hasn't changed. And so what God expected in a moral sense of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is that which He expects of us. Four points in the lesson. Number one, you've got to walk the walk. Number two, you've got to talk the talk. Number three, you've got to take a stand for that which is right. And number four, you've got to learn how to be honest. Now let's look at it. Now these, if you'll notice, are color-coded. And in the slides that follow, the colors of the, that are there on the screen will be transposed and put as a part of the looking at Psalms 15, just so you understand the mechanics. For example, he who, he who walks the walk is colored, by, is, is, is colored in the red. And so when we look at Psalms 15, we're going to look at those verses that talk about walking the walk. Who is going to abide in His holy tabernacle. Number one, He who walks the walk. Now look at verse one, or verse, verse two. Who may abide in the tabernacle of God? That individual who walks uprightly and works righteousness. We know that. That's no revelation. But you and I need to be reminded that there is that standard of right that has nothing at all to do with my emotions, has nothing at all to do with my feelings, has really nothing at all to do with if, whether or not I can understand why, why God would ever expect this of anybody. The Bible over and over again talks about it's not in man that walks to direct his steps, Jeremiah 10, 23. There's a way that seems right to a man. The ends there are of the ways of death, Proverbs 16, 25. You know, you've, get, you've driven your car and you've just gone the way that you thought was right and there's not a, not a one of us who's had our driver's license more than a week that has not gotten lost already driving the car. You know why? You don't know how to get around. And so there is that standard of right. Will we learn that? The man who is pleasing to God is that man who sees that God is sovereign and, it, and, and, and we're simply servants of the God of heaven and, and when we come together, we're going to worship Him. Why? Because God is here. Because His words are being spoken and His name is being praised and there is the rightness that there is with God. And I don't know how to phrase it better. Somebody else probably can phrase it so much better than I, but I want you to know, and I don't want you to ever forget it, it is always right to do right. It's always wrong to do wrong. And it's never right to do wrong, and it's never wrong to do right, and that is right because the Bible is right. Now, when you've got a decision to make, the question that ought to be foremost in your mind about everything that's happening in your life, the question that ought to be foremost is this very question, what is the right thing to do? 
not what are the consequences of if I, you know, if I do this or do that. You make not decisions on the basis of would people be upset if I do this. You make not decisions on, uh, on the basis of would this be easier for me if I, do, if I would do it this way. Here is the man that is going to, to abide with God forever. And that is the man who says, here's the rule that I live by. I am going to do right. And teens who especially deal with that, deal with that matter of peer pressure. Guys, you got you to have a backbone like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that stands up for that which is right. I am not going to compromise in that area. I don't, I don't care what you try to get me to do. I am not going to talk that way. I'm not, I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to dress that way. I'm going to do right. Speaking of the backbone of Daniel, does anybody know over here why those lions did not eat Daniel? Because lions don't eat backbone. Do right. But it's not that. He's that individual who not only knows what is right, he does something about it. Christianity is a chore. It's a responsibility. It is a work. And so the verse says, that man who will dwell in his holy hill is that man who works righteousness. You see the word right and upright and the word right and righteousness? Here, here's the individual who's going to go to heaven. It's not the man who can quote the Bible and then not live it. It's that individual who knows what right is and he is absolutely determined, I'm going to do what's right. Well, what if it causes trouble? What if there's some consequences of living right and doing right? You want to think of Job? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Didn't understand? Didn't have a clue what was going on? Could not figure it out why all of the adversity was in his life? And yet Job says, here is the principle by which I live, and that is I'm going to do what is right. Not only know what's right, I'm going to do what's right. And then I'm amazed at the second point. of How much of this passage is devoted to the use of the tongue? The phrase says, he speaks truth in his heart, does not back, uh, backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against a friend. You would think that the things found in this verse would, would, would occupy, you know, the most words. And yet once you lay the principle of, of walking righteously, of knowing righteousness, standing by an upright standard, and then doing right, then he begins to talk about talking right. And he, as you look at this, and we could spend so much time, folks, we need to be people who understand the principle that says, let your yea be yea and your nay, nay. You know what that means? You see, old King James, the 1611 says, yea and yea and nay and nay. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know the context of that? Part of the context of that in, in the first time it's used was, don't swear. You know, will you swear by your mother's grave that you'll do that? Will you swear upon a stack of Bibles that you'll do this? And so the Jews had already made out certain laws that you could swear by some things and it didn't make any difference whether you, whether you did it or not because it wasn't, you weren't really under oath whenever you said it. Isn't it amazing that America has arrived at the point that a man's got to be under oath before he'll tell the truth? Isn't that amazing? That's Washington. Well, he wasn't under oath. And I cannot help but think when he said he was going under oath, he wasn't under oath whenever he went under oath, so he may not be under oath even though he says he's under oath. I mean, that's the reality. But you see, the Bible says, you keep your word. 
you keep your word. You speak truth. Oh, there's so many principles about that. Revelation 21 8. Is there a song with that? Did somebody write a song about Revelation 21 8? At least the last part of it. All liars will have their part in a lake of fire. That's the verse that ought to make us be the people who speak the truth. Parents, you speak the truth to your kids. Don't you tell them something and not, and not keep your word. Young people, you speak the truth to your parents. Don't you tell them you'll be at one place and be at some other place. Don't you in the workplace lie for any reason. I love a young man I knew by the name of Paul in Birmingham years ago who when his boss says, well, just go to the phone, tell him I'm not here. And he said, I'm not going to do that because you are here. And here was his answer. If I'll lie for you, I'll lie to you. And I don't believe you want a liar working in this place. Christians ought to be known by the truthfulness. But you see, it's not just that. It is this backbiting The expression that we use more, we understand more frequently, he stabbed him in the back. You know, you can't, you can't abide with God if, you're, if you stab somebody in the back. If what you are to somebody when you're talking to them face to face and you're, not, you're, you're being dishonest about it. There's, there's not a one of you that would want in a dating situation. For that young man or that young lady you're dating to be one thing to your face and another thing to your back. And if you wouldn't want that in that situation, you wouldn't dare want it in any relationship on this earth. There's nothing more painful than when somebody we love and trust stabs us in the back. And it happens. There's nothing more painful to a, to a husband or to a wife than to find out their mate is stabbing them in the back. You see, we're not talking about the external aspects of Christianity or David's not talking about the external attributes of, of Judaism. He's talking about this fact that you don't want to do harm to your neighbor. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, lie not one to another for your members one of another. If I lie about you, then I've harmed the body of Jesus of which I am a member that's true in every relationship. We could spend so much time there, but look at that last one. He does not take up a reproach against a neighbor. You know what that is? Rumors. Rumors. You see, this passage condemns that man who starts the rumor. He's not the one who speaks truth. But here is that individual who sees something on, the, on, on you know, Facebook, on the internet. And they can hardly wait to forward that to somebody else. And a rumor that is spread can never, ever, ever be brought back again. It's what happens in families. When people look at other members of the family and, and, and they don't start the rumor. They just say, well, you know what your brother told me about? You know what your brother told me about that? Sometimes I think we, we, we fail to understand that when somebody is reproached, that individual who starts the lie and tells everybody that is truth is slandering that individual. But he, is he any more guilty than that individual who takes up the lie and spreads the lie itself? Before you say anything, is it true? And will this do harm, do evil against my neighbor? Why is it that we cannot understand that? Number three, 
He takes a stand for that which is right. And the explanation is, here's this vile person and he's despised. We live in an age of compromise in which we think it's almost an ungodly attitude to have that attitude to have this attitude towards somebody. We don't hate the person, but we hate to, our, to the very depths of our souls what they're doing. <clears throat> Folks, is there vileness in Washington? I'm not talking politically. But I'm talking about elections that are coming up and you and I need to understand that evil is evil regardless of who advocates it. Vileness is vile. And you and I need to have an appreciation of the fact that those who are murdering babies in a legal thing called abortion are vile people. But you don't have to go to Washington to define that. You and I need to be people that stand for that which is right. And we don't condone it. We don't try to make friends with, with those who are, who are verbalizing words that are coming straight out of hell. You want to dwell in God's holy tabernacle? then don't you dare take up a reproach against some other person and don't you dare try to justify the ungodly. And you can take that across the board. Get it out of Washington and put it in your own family. If your children or brothers or sisters or mother or father or cousins, if your relatives are doing that which is evil, don't try to stand and defend them and say, well, you just don't understand them. You don't understand what a hard time they had. You don't understand the background of that. Look, love that child, love that person, but hate that evil and don't you dare try to justify evil. Why? Because that's the way God is. God loves that man who's done evil and will do everything he can to get into heaven. And you and I need to be the kind of person that will do everything we can to help that person get to heaven. But we cannot condone that. That vile person is despised by those who want to go to heaven. Folks, God expects you to have the same conviction of right and wrong that allowed Jesus to go to Calvary. He stood there with spittle running down his face and his own blood running down his body and a crown of thorns on his head because he wouldn't compromise, because he wouldn't try to, try to just say, well, let's get along with everybody and whatever it takes, we'll just do whatever it takes. Folks, it is wrong to do wrong. And we've got to stand for that which is right. And he honors those who fear the Lord. Don't you ever apologize for some member of this church or some brother in Christ who's trying to stand for that which is right. You don't have to defend his methods. Maybe, maybe abrasive in the way that he says it, but don't you belittle him for doing that which is right. He honors those who fear the Lord. This church ought to be a place where our older members who are godly are held up and honored. And we do all that we can to bring glory and honor to them. As simple a thing as saying to them, you don't know what an encouragement you are. I watch some of our older members try to struggle to walk all the way from the parking lot to get in this building. Maybe have to stop out there in the foyer. 
just to be able to be able to be here today. And we get out, get upset because they're in our way coming up and down the aisle. We can't get around them. There's more devotion in the heart of that individual than there is in a, in a person who has absolutely good health who looks on worshiping God as a take it or leave it thing. And when I see those coming in Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, I wonder how on earth that great example of devotion to God can be manifested in the hearts and the lives of every one of us and we see it and we appreciate it and we thank, we're thankful that they're that way. And then somehow we take just a flippant attitude in our own lives. We ought to honor those that feel the Lord. We ought to honor those who are teaching our children the Bible up and down the classrooms. We ought to honor those mothers and fathers who are sitting here right now with children in their laps and they're fighting and struggling with children in their laps, but they're here because they want, they want their children to grow up knowing the, the joy and the worship of God and bring glory. we need to bring glory and honor to them and say to them, I'm so thankful that you're bringing your children. Why? Because they're here because they fear the Lord. You know the easiest thing to do well, my child's grouchy. I'll stay home this morning. I won't worship God. Honoring those who fear the Lord. And young people, I wish I knew more than I know in your lives of just stories where you stood up for that which is right. I wish I knew more of the stories of that young man who said, I cannot conscientiously do this. And everybody in the room laughed at him. You cannot help but honor somebody that has that conviction. And I'm not talking about heaping praise and honors on Dan and David or Casey. I'm talking about looking around this room and bringing glory and honor to those who sacrificially serve God. And then finally, the matter of money. So it's not just in our day. It's the dishonesty that was there in David's day Here's the man who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own heart, hurt, and it does not change. He's so honest that he'll hurt himself before he'll be dishonest. And he's not that covetous individual who is out to take advantage of everybody that he knows. That matter of usury was used in a, in a biblical sense of unjust and unreasonable charges oftentimes. And he doesn't take a bribe. Sometimes as I read this passage, I've thought about, wouldn't it be great if instead of the Ten Commandments that they fuss and argue about, that Washington put Psalms 15 on some plaque in Washington. He does not take a bribe. You know what, somebody who takes a bribe, he doesn't speak the truth, says one thing and does another. He'll go behind your back and, and betray you. He's a backbiter. In order to, to gain possessions, he'll take up a rumor against somebody and spread that rumor in relationship to them. Why? Because he's guilty of idolatry, for covetousness is idolatry. Is money evil? Is it evil? Good or bad? 
And I use this illustration again because these young people haven't heard it. There's money. And I can take this money and I just start bringing it closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer until I can't see anybody but George. And that's true of every one of us. Money's not evil. But when that individual will lay aside the principles of righteousness for financial gain, somebody said, Dan, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Well, I'm talking about parents, mothers and fathers who work so many long hours, they never have any time for their children to mold and to shape the lives of their children. You're so they have the latest automobiles, two of them, please. I'm talking about individuals who'd be dishonest in business. And you've felt it in your life when others have been dishonest with you when you said, how much will it cost you to fix it? And how thankful we are that we can be the recipients of the blessings of others who are not that way. Look at the bottom of the line. He who does these things shall never be moved. You want to be a rock of Gibraltar in your family? You want to be that individual who is the foundation of a youth group, a young adult group? Then be this kind of person right here. I'm going to know right, I'm going to do right, I'm going to talk right, I'm going to take a stand for that which is right, and I am not for sale. And he says, and he'll never be moved. God help us to get away from the mindset that all that is involved in Christianity is here is on this table and in these songs and on things that are on the screen. And help us to recognize that this is only the place where we come to get our batteries recharged so that we can walk out of this place and spread the light that is in this place like salt and leaven to spread that in every place that we go. God help us. The invitation song says, Jesus is tenderly calling. You want to get to the mountaintop? You'll never get there without faith. John chapter 3 and verse 16 just says that. You won't get there until you make up your mind I've waited too long. I have decided that today is the day I'm going to give my life to the Lord. I'm going to make that decision. You cannot go to heaven unless you repent. And then when you have confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, on the basis of that faith that you have verbalized, you can be immersed in water and washed in the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood we sang about it. And he'll add you to his family. If you haven't done that, you can do that today. If you're an unfaithful Christian, you need to come home. You need to see Jesus as he's calling tenderly. Jesus is tenderly calling today. Come home. Come home right now. As together we stand and sing. Will you come?